we have strict instruction that we have to finish this session by three o'clock. Um, but let that not stop you from asking questions. We are friendly and small enough, so I will try my best to give everyone a chance. So when you do get a chance, please be brief. If you have more than one question, I will try my best to come back to you in the second round. So in the first round, I'll try to take three questions and then give the panel a chance, and then we will do as many rounds as necessary and possible. Okay. So um, I have two hands, three hands here. So first three, these three questions. Yeah, please. Uh, hi, I'm from University of Gothenburg. I've seen this um, overall performance uh, improved in health. But I, my question is how much this performance is owing to changing in health behavior, because changing health behavior for me is more sustainable than just external forces uh, to the people. This, that's my question. Hello, I'm uh, from University of Copenhagen, and I think my question is mostly for Michael. I was just wondering if you had given any thought to the business proposal. So if, if it's possible to drive investments in health through uh, making a business proposal for factories, for example, that the productivity gain may be large enough for it to actually be a sustainable business investment. And if so, uh, how it would be possible to promote this? and which fields you think uh, would, this would be particularly interesting in. Okay, my name is uh, Dick Duraval from University of Gothenburg. My question is really to Joko. You mentioned all the mechanisms that lead from health to wealth, and you said took by behavior, behavioral change. And it's obvious that if somebody gets cancer or a death sentence, that they will not invest in education and so on. But do you have any strong evidence that Improved health actually affects behavior in general, maybe among those that just have a small risk of getting ill. The panelists come back with questions. The others may think about further questions to ask. So. <laughs> okay. Um, so starting from the last question, um, you mentioned that you were asking about the channels from health to wealth. And I think uh, there are several channels, and you were specifically asking about the investment. Yeah, I'm or, asking, I'm asking yes, yeah. there is. There is uh, very rich, rich evidence on that. And uh, so, for each of the channels that I explained, the demographic and the investment and education, and uh, and each of them, they have they are backed by both micro and macro uh, data. So, for example, microeconomic evidence is that, or as I mentioned, RCTs. So, if you give, if you take all the Indonesia, I think the um, Duncan Thomas uh, study was uh, RCT in 700,000 Indonesian uh, productive women and men, and they did a randomized uh, control trial, and they gave um, iron supplements to one group and nothing to the other. Uh, placebo to the other. And they did find that people who got iron supplements were more productive compared to those who weren't. And also there is um, uh, evidence, th there are uh, micro, both micro and economic evidence. Uh, uh, education, there's, it's very rich. So it's almost undisputed that better education leads to better wealth in the economics. That was my question. Uh -huh. So... Uh -huh. behavior because you expect the, uh, oh life so like the investment then yes at directed. the macro level there is data that's right there is a, a huge uh, if, um, I think in the recent years um, this behavioral economics how that plays role in developing economics has really changed and uh, and I think uh, even experimental data there is evidence on that. So it is, there is scientific evidence. Um, and then the first question, um, well, I guess the question to Michael, I'm sure that you, you follow, but I think that the, like the, there, there's a lot of evidence in like HIV um, high prevalence countries, like the, for example, mining countries, uh, mining companies, uh, they've really invested in the health of workers and then um, therefore um, improve the, the the productivity of the company because I mean if HIV affected twenty three percent of the the productive population there's no way that you don't do anything about that 
and it makes economical sense. Um, and then the first question um, on the how, what, how much of it is behavioral, I'm not sure uh, if all that behavior is what's driven because, I mean, take pneumonia and diarrhea. Uh, the, mo most of the children under five that still die are dying from pneumonia and diarrhea. And that, and the, there's ways to prevent it and there's ways to treat it and it's very cost effective. But still, children are dying. So, I mean, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, just to go back to that first thing, I mean, if you immunize a child, then you don't get a disease. So I think for communicable diseases, I think it's a critical issue for non-communicable diseases and for HIV AIDS. But um, so I think it really just depends which disease you're talking about. I don't think you can make blanket statements like that. Um, and I think that one of the advantages of health is that we do have these technologies like, like, like immunization that are highly successful and highly cost effective. I mean, in terms of investment cases, I mean, so first of all, that's the new term that everyone is using, you know, so um, for the new global financing facility for MCH, people are developing investment cases for MCH. UNAIDS has the investment case for <laughs> HIV AIDS. So that terminology has now permeated. Um, and it, as you said, as Yoko said, I think that there has been a lot of interest for large companies, say, for example, for HIV AIDS and also for malaria and for other diseases. What I would say that um, one of the, I think, broader issues for human development um, is that most of the focus is on children. But if you think about it from a human capital standpoint, what we should be particularly interested in is adults. And that I think that's one of the things that came out from the HIV AIDS epidemic and why some of the South African big companies did invest because they were using, losing their labor. But I think that we tend to underinvest in adult diseases, like for example, chronic diseases like diabetes and heart attacks, in, in Africa and in, in low-income countries because that's not part of the Millennium Development Goal, hadn't historically been part of the Millennium Development Goals, and yet those are critical, I think, for, for economic investments um, in the country. And then just to go back to your question, I mean, there was, a, I mean, first of all, just, I mean, about 10 years ago, there was a huge review, you know, from the Macroeconomic Commission on Health that actually did both the, both reviewed both the macro and micro studies that you were talking about and actually saw, I mean, causation in both ways. But Obviously, it makes sense that that there would be, I mean, if you think about malaria, for example, I mean, one of the reasons that you have relatively low agricultural productivity is because a lot of the workers actually are suffering from malaria. And actually, you see significant improvements in agricultural productivity once you start decreasing malaria. I'm sorry, I'm not talking, asking about productivity. I mean, you, that's obvious. What I'm asking about is change, the change in behavior due to better more expectations of better health. You know, you change your investment, future investments. I mean, there are studies that show that if you get a, if you find out that you're really not well, I mean, you might not study as much. But are the strong effects? Yeah, I mean, the there's other strong direction? studies of that already from just the AIDS epidemic in Africa, you know, with the introduction of treatment. There's been dra dramatic changes in household behavior, you know, because people were... Yeah, if you, if you get a yeah. medicine, but I'm talking in general. I mean, it's got a, it, that doesn't have a very strong impact on the economy in general. I mean, there are many okay. studies on the impact of health on, on, on growth or the economy in general, and they don't find a very strong effect. I, I think uh, the, the main point is that we should not assume that there is a causal relationship in one way or the other. And the fact that a certain level of uh, achievement has taken place might influence the behavioral assumptions. I think that is the point. But I'm going to stop there. We can continue further discussion during the coffee break. I'm going to invite Curry to... Thank you. I, I think that this only this first question is, is my area of expertise about the role of uh, behavior in, in in diseases and as, especially in, or at least in, in chronic diseases. Of course, health behavior is, is most important. It's may, maybe a bit misleading sometimes to give these heritability estimates because somebody may think that uh, it's it's kind of excluding the role of behavior, but this is not the case. For example, if you look at these clone candidate genes of uh, obesity, they are all expressed mainly in, in hypothalamus. And it is very likely that uh, actually the mechanism how these uh, 
genes affect uh, uh, obesity is that they some way modify uh, human human uh, eating behavior, and, and and that's why they they uh, increase the probability to develop obesity. We have actually pretty interesting results about this field uh, uh, just just accepted for publication, and um, and. Um, yeah, and, uh, uh, and um, other issue is that uh, uh, if you look at the chronic diseases, uh, it is it also it is maybe uh, maybe it can be a bit misleading to talk too much about this childhood nutrition because it's also that is modified by adult behavior. We know that uh, we have uh, epidemiological evidence to show that, uh, uh, suggesting that uh, childhood malnutrition is, um, is associated with a higher prevalence of coronary heart disease. However, this is not a situation in all populations. Uh, for example, this, this applies very well in, in many uh, Western populations. But for, if you look at, uh, for example, Japan, we don't, we don't see this kind of association because also Japan was a very poor country before the Second World War. And, um, and we could expect that because of this very rapid economic development in, in Japanese population, uh, there would be a massive increase in, in coronary heart disease. This is, however, not the case. There is uh, coronary heart disease rates are at a very low level in, in the Japanese population, and, and so are uh, also all metabolic diseases. Um, only, only one exception is a stroke be, uh, because of the high salt consumption in, in the Japanese population. And so this is not a deterministic process, but uh, uh, by health behavior, it's, it's surely possible uh, to prevent this kind of diseases and, and uh, health behavior in, in the population is very strongly modifies both genetic and, and this uh, childhood uh, environment or risk factors of, of chronic diseases. We can have another round of questions. One, two, three, and four. Uh, hello, my, my name is Helle Samuels, and I'm from University of Copenhagen. I'm not an epidemiologist, not an economist, but I have a question to the last presentation uh, on the BI, BMI uh, and the difference between Western countries and Japan. I don't know if you have data on Africa. If you have, what does, do they show? Or if you don't have, what would you predict? What would the differences in BMI and the different groups of professionals show? Thank you. Thank you all presenters for your interesting presentations. I'm Satu Ulisara from University of Helsinki. Um, I just wanted to find out what your thoughts were in terms of human resources for health and the kind of graph that you, Yugo, showed um, for the age in, in Africa and the kind of very you know, rapid demographic growth. I mean, how, how do you see this playing out in, in the coming decades? Thank you. Uh, my name is Abruna from Akira University of Uganda. Uh, my concern has to do with the, uh, the progress of our med. Uh, yes, we made progress, but I think we would have made more progress if we need more money for health, yes, but I think we should also look at more health out of the resources we have. I think that can only be realized if we mainstream health in all the policies of the various ministries and not leave it to the Minister of Finance and Minister of Health. It's not a question, just an addition. Thank you. We'll take responses from the panel, and then I'll come back for a final set of questions. So, um, so this idea of multi-sectorality, I think, is critically important. I think it's particularly important for non-communicable diseases <laughs> like obesity. I would say, going back to more health for the money, I mean, did you say you're from Ghana? Is that Uganda? Uganda. Uganda. That I, I think that if you look at um, the health facilities themselves, they're not particularly efficient. Um, and if you, I mean, they're like, I, for example, there's a study in Uganda showing huge variations in the performance of health facilities. You have a national health service system. You, you pay by input-based budgeting. So I would say that is a critical challenge about improving 
the efficiency of health service production in Uganda. And I, I mean, so although I, I agree ge more generally on the broader issue of multi-sectorality, and I have to say Finland is one of the countries that leads sort of international work on this kind of the Commission on Social Determinants and doing working across ministries. But in the particular case of Uganda, I would say there's real need to change the performance of the health service not not just actually working multi-sectoral, but that there's a critical issue for both the ministries of health and finance to work together to change the way the NHS works in Uganda. Mm -hmm. The human resource question, do you want to come back? Or? Well, I think generally, I mean, what we would hope for Africa is that they will have this demographic dividend, you know, that you're going to see like the epidemiological transition. You're going to see like, uh, so they currently have a lot of, you know, they have a relatively high population growth rate. It will start to decline. And then they'll have this demographic dividend, you know, that that like China, for example, and a lot of other countries have had actually. And so I, I hope that's what will happen in Africa. I think um, it obviously, you know, Africa is a very large continent. So I mean, the the countries that were there's a, a group of countries with generalized AIDS epidemics where where that demographic dividend is is more complicated actually, and they have a critical challenge of how to actually, you know, solve the AIDS epidemic when you have like you know. 20% of the adult population with AIDS. And that, that's a very specific case, actually, say, for example, for South Africa. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything on those two questions before I pass on to Kari? Um, um, yes, um, more health for money, um, I agree. And also, but I think with all the money that's going into aid, I also question, are the aid being used, going into the right area and supporting the right things and just looking into the simple analysis that I'm doing with DHS. Uh, it's really the basic fundamental public health intervention that's cost effective that is really associated with reduction in child health. But of course, all the money is going into more sort of flashier, easy to see results um, sort of interventions. And we don't really see the benefit of that. So like, it, I mean, if we don't really have the evidence that these interventions are affecting the 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 under five mortality rate. I mean, where do we go from that? And like sectors like water and sanitation, that's like multi-sectorial and hard to see civil registration and vital statistics, for example, uh, that would benefit the population. Like, how do you finance that? Um, and also like breastfeeding practices, like literally no donor has supported that. And it was almost uh, con uh, contra to the contrary, because of this HIV epidemic and HIV experts and their sort of strong advocates, um, that's probably why the breastfeeding coverage rate has gone down instead of up in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa countries. So like, these are questions that I have for the the, health and development in the next years. Um, and then on the uh, human resources and demographics, uh, I agree with Michael and like just the population and age structure is so drastically different. Um, and, and I think there's just so many elements that's different about Sub-Saharan Africa and, um, and Asia and Latin America that but what I do reflect from this conference is that economists, they do really focus on GDP per capita and like this monetary way of measuring things. And when there are just really many fundamental factors that affect the economy and productivity and welfare of the populations, like health. And um, so, but, and, and also when we look into the historical development, there are many puzzles. I think the development in Latin America and Asia it's sort of following the US and North America and Europe model where kind of the overall infrastructure and, and economic development and health are sort of gradually like going, developing, going in the better direction. Whereas Sub-Saharan Africa, some things have really gone better, like the immunization coverage and in reducing child mortality. But then the, if that wasn't followed up with better nutrition, like what does that imply for the this generation of children? They're surviving, but they're not uh, healthier. They're not stronger. So what what is the implication of the productivity of this generation? I have a couple of points to say, but I will see if I get a chance towards the end, I will say that. But I would request Kari to respond to the BMI question and also the others. 
Yeah, actually, unfortunately, very little is known about uh, chronic diseases and obesity in African population. But I would expect that this is actually inverse gradient in, in African population. And there is a slight evidence that, for example, cardiovascular diseases are more uh, prevalent in upper socioeconomic groups. In, uh, at least in Kenya, I think that there is one, one study about that. And it is very expected results because these uh, chronic diseases, they are driven by westernized lifestyle, like sed sedentary behavior and, and, and westernized diet. And it's, it's quite likely that this is uh, more typical in, in upper socioeconomic classes in, in poor countries. On the other hand, it is not only a question about the affluence, but it's, we have some speculated that this may be also because of this volunteer health behavior. Because how we explain these results from Japan is that uh, uh, maybe uh, working class persons, they are more conservative in their behavior. And, and so in, in Finland, they, uh, they used to have a health, uh, poor health habits because traditional Finnish diet is not very healthy. But in, in Japan, working class Japanese men, they follow this healthy Japanese nutrition. And that's why they don't develop obesity and, and there is no gradient in, in, in these uh, uh, chronic diseases. And, and the same can, similar results can be also found in, in Mediterranean countries where there is no any socioeconomic gradient in, in cardiovascular diseases. So maybe lower level mid in, uh, in, in Mediterranean uh, uh, people in Mediterranean countries, they follow this very healthy Mediterranean diet. And, and, and so I would expect that in, in for partly for, because of the poverty, but maybe partly also because volunteer health behavior we can, uh, in, in lower socioeconomic classes, we can see the inverse gradient in, in, uh, in African countries. But surely would be very, very interesting topic for future research. Uh, I have a couple of points to say, but I will give preference to you. And if, okay, one and two. Could you kindly be very brief? We are sure. very, very short of time. Absolutely. Right. I'm James Thurlow from IFPRI. And um, I was just thinking about this issue of trying to mainstream or to try and speak more, more directly to the Ministry of Finance. And I think one of the one of the real challenges we have is to do some of these translations of, of say, health interventions or nutrition outcomes into effects on GDP. I don't think we can run away from GDP. That's the language of the Ministry of Finance. And so we have to meet them where they are. And so I know in the climate change literature or in energy, we go to great lengths to try and take the tools that the ministry uses and augment them and see what does energy investment mean for GDP and poverty. And I think at IFPRI, we're trying to get nutrition mainstreamed in those tools that the ministries use. The challenge is on the health people to do that, rather than to wait for the Ministry of Finance to come to you. Can you please be very brief? Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, the question is short. Is there, isn't there a better measure than BMI on, on, on obesity? I'm, I'm, I'm just under overweight. You know, I'm tall and slim. But the taller you are, the more biased, I think, the BMI measure is. Another problem is that people are getting stronger. And I'm sure that if you look at a manual worker in Sweden, he's much more muscular than a manager. So I think there are two biases. That are, I wonder, isn't there a better measure that could correct for this? I, I, I think we are almost at the end of time, unless my panelists desperately want to respond. Can I summarize? Yeah. Um, I'm sure these are, one is a comment, and the other one, I think, is a question for, for the research. There are just a couple of points I wanted to add. I think when we are thinking about health, in broader human development terms. I think it underpins uh, in terms of uh, freedom to live a long and healthy life. Um, and that, that is kind of the starting point for human development. So when you mentioned human resource question, I think there is a human resource question related to that is a human capital question. I, th I think much broader is the human development question in terms of health as underpinning human development. And related to that also, Yoko mentioned about the demographic transition. Associated with that, we also have the so-called epidemiological transition. So as people become more urbanized and more educated in developing countries, you have also non-communicable diseases. There is a group of population where non-communicable diseases are the number one priority. And there is another group of population who are probably in the rural backward areas and who are not benefiting from the development. For them, still the com communicable and infectious diseases are the priority. And then if you have a political economy where health resources are allocated based on power, et cetera, 
then there is always a pressure that maybe the urbanization, you know, urban sectors get much more. So you will have a lot more of the health budget going to non-communicable diseases, which benefit the urban richer middle classes. And related to that is, I think, number of people, and especially our colleague from Uganda raised, I think it is absolutely correct that in developing countries, the share of GDP going to health is still very small. Of course, within that, the private sector's share is much bigger. And there is no doubt that overall amount of resources going to health has to increase. Where will those additional resources come from is one question. And then that doesn't mean then we don't address the inefficiencies that are there in existing use of resources. A lot of amount of wastage and wasteful allocation is there. So I think both of those and improving in general the accountability of uh, health expenditures. I think these are big challenges, which I'm sure Yoko and other our fellow researchers will address in the coming, coming, uh, coming decades. So let us express our appreciation to all three of our panelists and we close this session. Thank you.